Good afternoon. My name is Amelie Amin, a Director of Climate Change at CDC Group. So thank you for the opportunity to share some of my thoughts around how to increase private sector investment in adaptation and resilience. So I'm going to provide an overview and context and then do a deeper dive into resilient infrastructure. First of all, in terms of the challenge, we know that climate change is already affecting our economy, our society and our environment. And these material impacts will only worsen, even if we meet the Paris objectives. A UN adaptation gap report in 2018 estimates annual costs of adaptation ranging between 140 and $300 billion by 2030, increasing to 280 to $500 billion per annum by 2050. Fiscal impacts of climate also disproportionately impact the poorest countries, regions, and sectors of society. Being able to address the finance and investment needs will require much greater contribution of private sector investment. At the same time, old models of insurance and force majeure are breaking down. Insurance risk transfer and other risk financing solutions will increasingly need to be embedded into macro fiscal frameworks and given budget allocations. Climate adaptation strategies can benefit from insurance industry expertise and ensure that specific insurance solutions for financial protection also incentivize risk reduction and preparedness. There's also much greater awareness of investors now around climate related risk. Following the task force and climate related financial disclosure, we're seeing much greater transparency of physical and transition risks. If unaddressed, this will serve to increase the cost of capital and may in some cases lead to capital flight. However, the TCFD recognizes that whilst there are also risks, there are also potential opportunities and how to uh, address or realize these opportunities is therefore a key issue now for policymakers. When we look at some of the barriers to investment in ANR, um, there are perceptions that these investments will only provide a public benefit. Uh, the risk reward profile and the capital intensive nature of many investments can also be prohibitive. There's generally a lack of capital, affordable capital, limited human resource and know-how uh, to, to reach target markets and create further barriers to the market formation and investment. As early stage and innovative technologies in many cases, uh, these will take time to achieve market acceptance. There's also a limited understanding of what we mean by these types of investments, no common metrics or standardized. Uh, approach towards these. So this all underscores the urgency and the requirement for much greater public sector effort to be able to address and increase these market barriers to increase adaptation related investment opportunities that can deliver positive societal impact as well as a financial return. Generally, public private collaboration will be required to increase and develop domestic markets and investments that are resilient to climate change. Collaboration around industry, benchmarks, standards and taxonomies is already underway. And these will be increasingly useful both for governments to create tools and provide incentives, as well as to provide much greater certainty for investors. So diving a little bit deeper into infrastructure and how to increase resiliency of infrastructure. First, it's important to recognize that adaptation and resilience can be addressed across the project cycle. In fact, needs to be addressed across the project cycle. It's absolutely essential to ensure that climate risk and resiliency incentives are embedded upfront, upstream into the institutional context and ensure that the policy and regulatory context, uh, particularly around public procurement uh, and public private partnerships guidelines, that that creates incentives for sharing of climate risk, as well as responsibilities for managing climate risk 
and integrating resiliency across the project cycle. So this shows uh, the, the importance of upstream role of the public sector, but increasingly the interactions with the private sector as you move down the project cycle, particularly during the procurement and contracting stage. It's also really important to ensure that effective planning and design tools are used, uh, using the best available data, uh, different analytics that are becoming increasingly sophisticated through the use of AI to understand better some of the potential implications at the local con in the local context. Uh, apply, applying tools that can provide better spatial planning and ensure integration of climate risks and resiliency opportunities are fully integrated into the project appraisal process is also essential. And finally, uh, during the uh, construction, operation, maintenance, uh, it's important to recognise that potentially some of the measures that may be required for resiliency uh, and adaptation can be built in over time. Uh, you may not want to build the infrastructure to uh, withstand a four degree scenario or three degree scenario, but it will be important to ensure flexibility and that this level of resiliency can be added on, bolted on relatively easily in future. So diving a little deeper into the PPP process and ways in which uh, governments can uh, share risks and responsibilities of uh, climate risk and resiliency with the private sector, uh, it's important to think uh, what this means in terms of the procurement process in particular. So ensuring there'll, there'll be an initial screening at project identification uh, but then a much more detailed assessment of climate risk will be required at the business plan stage. And ensuring that resiliency requirements are integrated into the request for proposals is another key step where public and private sector roles and responsibilities can be more clearly defined. So looking at the business case, I think what's important to recognise that until recently, climate risk was often only assessed in terms of the environmental impact assessment. But what's clearly now being seen as good or best practice is to ensure that climate risk is actually integrated into the financial feasibility assessment, the cost benefit analysis, as well as the value for money assessment, ensuring it's fully integrated across uh, the whole business plan. When looking at the procurement stage, resiliency requirements can be set out in the RFP. Uh, this can follow two main ways. There can be either minimum requirements set. These are often uh, best used when the procuring agency knows what it wants with regards to uh, climate resiliency, and then setting out some sort of minimum requirements that are used as pass fail criteria during procurement. Another approach is to set out evaluation criteria, and this can be valuable if the procuring agency wants bidders to differentiate themselves on climate resilience, or if the agency wants to confirm that it's comfortable with the approach that bidders are looking to follow. This, to pursue this approach, there'll need to be capacity on the side of the procuring agency to evaluate the climate proposals that are put forward. However, this approach can often deliver best value and certainly a more innovative uh, set of responses. Uh, sometimes a hybrid approach between these two may be followed. Another key issue uh, is the um, uh, extent to which the project can be insured. So typically, uh, authorities would require the private party to insure material project risks, such as accidental damage, third party liabilities. And so the availability, cost and obligation to take out insurance uh, will depend on the extent to which certain events are likely to take place. So typically when defining a force majeure, a particular climate risk like flooding is excluded and instead transferred to the private party and then the private party may need to take out insurance to cover any expected loss from this risk. 
However, extreme events like natural disasters pose a set of challenge, challenging problems to insurers as they are very uncertain, but involve potentially very high losses. So the insurance industry is actively trying to stay ahead of the curve with regards to this particular issue. And looking at the length of a PPP contract, it becomes clear that a particular climate related event is likely to take place. So the question then is whether it is insurable or uninsurable. Uninsurability doesn't mean the market has no insurance, but rather that insurance is unavailable on the international insurance market or that the insurance premiums are prohibitively high. So for example, such a level, the risk is not being insured against in a worldwide uh, insurance market um, by reputable insurers of good standing by contractors in the same country. So while risk just beyond climate could possibly become uninsurable, building an uninsurability clause into the PPP contract can help make the PPP inherently more climate resilient. In doing so, this acknowledges the uncertainty around climate change and the difficulty of insuring them. Generally speaking, to really fully integrate climate risk and resiliency, a systemic change is really needed. This requires a focus at the upstream uh, stage to ensure that uh, climate risk and resiliency is fully integrated into the policy regulatory frameworks, procurement, PPP guidelines and incentives. Ensure appropriate standards and that relevant data and tools are being deployed. There's a need for much greater public-private partnerships between government, financial institutions, businesses and communities at risk and then ensure a fairly harmonised approach towards how climate risk management tools, metrics and standards are then being deployed to provide a more certain environment for private sector investments in particular. And all of this will require significant increase in the technical and financial capacity of governments and the private sector, use of relevant data and tools, as well as often more innovative financial solutions, particularly where uninsurability may become increasingly an issue. So thank you and happy to respond to any questions.